and uh, re really appreciate your welcome and uh, really do appreciate the invitation to be able to come to uh, speak to you this morning and I thank you for that because uh, I really do enjoy coming out to the churches and um, uh, around our, our conference and I always en enjoy it very much um, um, to be here. As I mentioned to you, uh, it's been almost 30 years since I've been to Wangarei. So, um, hmm. when, I, when I calculated that, I thought, hmm, that sort of makes you feel a bit old, doesn't it? <laughs> um, this is um, my first time I've worked in the North Island. I uh, arrived here uh, beginning of uh, last year. Um, I'm a South Islander by birth. And um, we moved here from Canberra when we, uh, um, beginning of last year to here, so that was our last appointment. My wife Joyce, um, she does apologise that she can't be here this morning. Um, she's just in the process of changing jobs and um, she's got to sit some uh, exams and tests for her new, new job and um, get some assignments done before she goes back um, to Samoa. She's going there for four weeks um, with her mum and um, so they're going to see how the, the family is over there. Um, so, she's got a, so she's under a bit of pressure at the moment and um, so I looked at her, she had the eyes hanging out of her sockets and uh, I said, hey, look, might be better if you just sort of rest today. <laughs> and uh, just sort of take it easy. So um, Joyce sends her apologies because she always lo loves coming. And um, that, so we have two kids, Helena and Anthony. Uh, Helena's 22 and Anthony's uh, 15. And uh, he loves driving at one speed, 15. I remember what that was like. <laughs> yeah, it's all a bit of a worry, isn't it, as they grow up? And uh, yeah, so we've got two, two lovely kids. I look after the, um, I'm, I'm just to let you know a wee bit about what I do in the, in, in the conference office. Look after the area of youth and family. And um, I'm the associate and I work with um, Pastor Mole, uh, which some or most of you will know. And um, work with the team there. So we had a, slight organize, reorganisation of our roles and I took over the, the family in the, in the middle of, in the area of family ministries in the middle of the year. So it's a great privilege to, uh, to work in ministry. This is my uh, 15th, 16th year. I've completed 15 years and uh, I have to say I enjoyed ministry very much. I've only ever written my resignation letter once on a sealed envelope, sat on the desk. I only ever did that once in my first year. But <laughs> I've enjoyed every minute of, of, of bar a few minutes, but <laughs> I've enjoyed um, the vast, 99% of the time in ministry. And it's, uh, it's great to be able to work for the Lord, isn't it? Whether we get paid or whether it's volunteer. And because um, we're all in this together, aren't we? To work for God and to extend his kingdom. And uh, it, it's important, and no matter what capacity we work in, to do our part and to do our part faithfully. And uh, the volunteers that make it happen are, are absolutely essential to furthering God's work. In fact, it's the most important, because it's not going to get done without us working with the Lord. Isn't that true? All right, well, we better, better not, um, well, better start our sermon, eh? I'd like you to turn to your Bibles, um, John chapter 19 and uh, verse 11. John chapter 19 and verse 11. This was when um, Jesus was with Pilate and um, 
he, he was on trial at this point in time. He was captured. He was under arrest. And um, this is what Jesus said, said, to, said to Pilate. Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Notice the first part here. You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. I'm sure Pilate sort of sat there and wondered what Jesus was going on about at that point in time. And, and, and I am 99.9% .9 certain Pilate didn't understand fully what Jesus was saying. But we have the benefit of hindsight here. What was he saying? You would have no power over me except if it was given to you from above. Now, if you think and process that with Jesus' life and his situation where he was at that point in time. Now, when Jesus was arrested and betrayed and then he received a beating and a whipping... And when those whippings were carried out by the Roman soldiers, the Roman soldiers did their job with great joy and great enthusiasm. And so when they sink the whip into you, they got claws on them, that they, like little fish hooks, and they just grab into your skin and they just catch enough to tear. Can you imagine how painful that would be? It's enough to sort of bring tears to your eyes with the pain, wouldn't it? Now, from a human perspective, if you were in that situation, you were arrested unjustly, you received a beating, which was unfair, and then you got a whipping, which excruciating pain beyond which you and I could ever believe. What would be the human reaction to that? Cold stare, maybe? Would anyone have any desire to get revenge? Anybody? Just one? Perhaps I'm the only one who would love to sort of, if you had the ability to be able to grab that Roman sh soldier and throttle his neck and punch him. Wouldn't you just, if you were in that situation, you would, I would have thoughts of revenge. But I'm, I'm just a human. Now, now think this from Jesus' perspective. Jesus having the power from above. And Jesus could say this. You would have no power to Pilate. You would have no power except that it was given to you. And it was given to you by who? By Christ. And so when he was being punished and he was being put on trial and you had the ability to just look at him and reduce him to a pillar of salt of any of the Roman soldiers, it would take incredible power of restraint, wouldn't it? Just, just, just think about that. What does this say about the character of, of the God we worship? Just think about that for a moment. Just think about it. What does that say about his grace? What does it say about his love for us? Because he did this for love. And, and as I sort of think about this, it would take it an enormous amount. You know, when you've got the power, the ultimate power to refrain from my human thoughts. You understand what I'm saying? 
You understand what I'm saying? So what does this say about the God we worship? What does this say about the grace that he has given to us? It says a lot about his character, doesn't it? And God's character is summed up by one word. Which word is it? God is God is love. God is love. Yet, you know, in, in, in my experience in, in ministry, I, I have seen and experienced many times the exact opposite in a place where it should be epitomized the most. That being the church. I remember one church I, I, I pastored and um, got the phone call because I was at the other church that I was working at. And um, <clears throat> there, there was an incident in the, in the church. And what happened was that people were coming in and at 10 past 11, they could hear yelling and screaming coming from the elders' room. And there was a big argument as to who was going to preach that day. And one person objected about this lady preaching. And there was a Mexican standoff. And when you people coming into the church and they were hearing all this, they didn't need to put a glass to the door. It was for all to hear. I was glad there was no visitors that day. And, you, and you're sort of left wondering, what, what's happened to the message here? What's happened to the message that is communicated to people but not quite incorporated into their everyday life? What, what, what's happened? Is there something missing? Is there something missing here? You know, I, I've had another in, well, number of incidences where a person has not spoken to the head elder for 16 years now. Hadn't spoken to the previous Sabbath school superintendent for 23 years now. Is there something odd? Is there something odd? You know, when, when we come into a church, shouldn't we be able to, shouldn't people be able to see the expression of God's love in our community here? Shouldn't we be able to see it, feel it, sense it? You see, People today not only want to hear the message, and in my father's generation, he wasn't an Adventist, but in my father's generation, they heard and responded to the message. But for younger generations, they not only need to hear the message, but they also need to see it demonstrated in the lives of the people. Is that fair enough? Absolutely. They need to hear it and see it demonstrated. Yeah, we're human, of course we are. Things do happen. But, you know, we can also say, hey, I made a mistake. I'm sorry about that. You know, these things of, of people not talking to each other for a quarter of a century. You know, it makes me weep. It makes me weep when, the head, when a head deacon is holding a young person by the neck and he's suspended from the ground because he threw stones in the car park. And the person who saw that walked in, walked back out again. And you sort of think, 
Mm. Was that a good look? Probably not. Mm. You know, one of the stories in the Bible that we know very well, in fact, we know it so well, I won't even take you to Luke chapter 15. Just to briefly summarise with the prodigal son when he was coming home and no doubt contemplating what he was going to say to his father and, and, and just playing it in his head over and over again. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? What am I going to say sorry? Well, I'll say it this way. I'll say, oh, Father, Father, I'm sorry, sorry for this, 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 this. And you know, you know how you, do, you what you would do? You would sort of play the scenario through your head 50 times you pre, and, and it comes out completely different when you do arrive. So anyway, he arrives, but his father, when he saw him afar off, what did the father do? He what? He ran. And of course we know that it's very difficult to run in traditional dress back then. He would have had to raise and expose his knobbly knees, which was culturally offensive to do that. And he ran to meet his son. And what were the three things that the father did? He did what? He placed a what? A ring. What was the other one? A robe. And gave him some sandals. Yeah, he gave him sandals. Okay, what, what, what did the ring symbolise? The ring symbolised belonging sonship. Belonging sonship. You are my son. Gave him the ring. Yeah. Gave, gave him him the robe and, and put it around him and the robe was a symbol of acceptance as well. And sandals, and of course that differentiated from lowly servants. So, he didn't even get a chance to run his speech that he rehearsed all the way he had walked. The father just embraced him Put the ring on his finger, you are my son. Robe around him, I accept you. Gave him the sandals just to reinforce the fact that you are family. You're not a servant. Wow. But, 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 you are my son. And of course, what did the father do then? He then what? He what, sorry? Had a feast. Had a feast. Okay, out with the barbecue. Killed a fatted calf and had a nice vegetarian beef barbecue. <laughs> Great Adventist lunch, eh? What do you reckon? Well, I don't think Paul Rankin from the health department may not approve of that right now. But anyway, they had a celebration and what was the other thing that happened? There was celebration and cultural dancing. And the brother, when he was out in the field, oh, I wonder what all the celebration is about. Oh, what's all the hubbub? So he comes up and sees his long lost brother. Well, the eyes of the, the daggers just. You know, if looks could kill, his, far, his brother would just go, Phew. he would be knocked over just there. He was furious. You know, there was at one church, I, I, a lady had come back after being 20 years away. And she had travelled 108 kilometres to our church. She thought, oh, I'll come to church today. One of the elders came to me and says, she hasn't been in our church for 20 years. You know what she did in our church 20 years ago? She did this, 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 this. So you've got to be really careful of her. This sounds like the brother who was, look at him. He was the one who took his inheritance, goes off and spends and comes back and you, and you welcome him back as though he's done nothing. It's just not right. It's not fair. We don't want him here at this place. Is that fair? Is it fair? No, it's not. No, it's not fair. But is grace fair? Hmm. 
<laughs> yes and no. It's yes when it's for us, isn't it? <laughs> it's yes when it's for me. All right? And it's fair when it's for me. But is it fair for someone else? Look what they've done. Look what he's done. Look what she did. That's not fair. It's the nature of grace, isn't it? So the brother was stood back and recounted all the things that he's done, and you and you haven't done anything for me. I have worked I have worked really hard. And you've never killed a half a cow for me. You never done this for me. Yet he did all this and you welcomed him back. And his father and pleaded with him. But aren't you happy your long lost brother has come back? And the brother said, No, I am not. Sad, isn't it? And that can be a picture of church. That can be a picture of church. That can be a picture of us. And we've got to be very careful that we don't act like the brother. You understand what I'm saying? Something we don't hear very often is the other half of the story to the prodigal son. The other, half of the, prod- the other half of the story of the prodigal son when the son got his nice new robe, nice new sandals and the ring on the finger, the brother comes up to him and says to him, your ring is on the wrong finger. It should be on your thumb. And he goes, takes the fin- ring off. But the ring doesn't fit on the thumb. Well, aren't you willing to put up with a bit of discomfort hmm? for the father, aren't you? Hey, come on, come on. Aren't you willing to do a little bit of sacrifice? It belongs, to the, it belongs on the thumb. It's tradition, and you should know that. Hmm, look at your robe. Hmm. You've got a spot on your robe right there. Looks at his robe. Oh, gosh. Father likes a clean robe. Father's not going to be very happy with a spot on your robe. Hmm? Huh. Look at those sandals. Those laces are, are far too tight. Come on. You've you got to do the things right, you know. You should know this. You've been away too long. Living the high life. Come on. And, and he looks at the robe and he's trying to get the, the, the ring on his thumb and doesn't fit properly. And he, he looks at the, at the spot on his robe and I think, oh, what am I going to do? I can't get the ring on. I've I got, I, I got a spot on my robe. I've got to get rid of it. And my sandals. And then the father comes along and son, where are you? Oh, no. Oh, no. I can't, he, he can't see me. I've got a spot on my robe. I've got a, got a ring, ring on my mother, thumb and, and, and my sandals. Are, oh, and runs off and avoids the father. We don't hear that half of the story very often. And, and you might be wondering where it is in the Bible. It's found in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. I'd like to come over to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6 to 7. And Paul writes to the Galatians and says this here. In Galatians 1 verse 6 says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and 
are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Let's come over to Galatians chapter 2 and verse uh, 16. Galatians 2 and verse 16. Uh, we'll start from verse 15. We, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law no one will be justified. And the Galatian controversy of what was going on there was between Gentiles and Jews. You had the Jews who were quite pharisaical in, in preserving their traditions and preserving the old ways. And you had the Gentiles who were very comfortable with the gospel of grace as it was preached. But there was a huge controversy in the church that raged at that point in time. And there was big arguments and it was splitting the church. They forgot an important commandment, which was not only to love God, but also to love your neighbor. They forgot that God is a God of love. And that his message centers around grace. But whereas there was an alternative gospel that were looking at the spots on other people's robes. You see, we are very good at spotting spots on other people's robes, aren't we? And we can see it with incredible clarity. Very, very good at it. But perhaps not quite so good at seeing our own spots. Mm. Does grace define us? Does grace define our attitudes? In 1347, and that's a long time ago, isn't it? 650 years ago, but a very significant date indeed. In 1347, a ship came into an Italian port and arrived from the Black Sea. When it arrived in port and it was boarded, they found half the crew dead. The other half wished they were dead. But the ones who were alive had boils all over their bodies that were bursting, they had high fever, they were very sick, very ill. When the boat came into land and they saw the disease and sickness, they then pushed the boat out to sea because, hey, we don't want this here, and they left them to die. But it was too late. The flea-infested rats made it to shore. That was in October 1347. So that was coming on to their winter. By spring, the Black Plague had spread to the shores of England. In five years, a third of the population of Europe had perished. That's 25 million in five years. That's a long time. That's a lot of people, isn't it? 25 million people in five years. Three centuries, the plague raged throughout Europe. And in 1665, in London alone, 100,000 people died just in one year. At its height, there was something like 7,000 people a day who were losing their lives. But it wasn't until the bitterly cold winter of that year that finally killed off all the fleas that halted the spread of the plague. But the plague is one of the, the, the blackest, the darkest, and the worst scourges to have hit humanity. But there's one more scourge that is much worse. 
And what is that scourge? Sin. Sin that affects us all, regardless of who we are. The deadliest scourge, the Bible reserves it for sin. Let's come over to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. We, and it says here, 53 and verse 6, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Each of us have turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here... Sin is something that is just not merely a slip-up or things that we do wrong. It is something that affects us all. In Ephesians 2.3, um, I, I like, I like to re read it to you from the message translation, and it says this, doing what we feel like doing when we feel like doing it. Now, I think that's a pretty good definition of, of sin. You see, sin is not only things that we do, things that we don't do. Uh, it also comes down to attitudes as well. See, see we like to sort of look at the, the big ones. You know, the, the, the two ultimate sins that pastors can be dismissed for. They can be forgiven for just about anything, but the two things that they cannot be forgiven for are things that you know very well. An adulterous affair or fingers in the till. But they can be just about forgiven for about anything else, bar those two. Be that as it may, we can argue the merits of that later. But we tend to look at the big things, you know, like we disfellowship people for... Basically one thing, usually affairs, things like that. So we look at the big things. But what about, you know, one of the core things of, of sin is just doing what I want when I like, when I feel like it. Doing what I want. And who is it about? Me. And if you sort of think about that for a moment in our Christian journey, are we affected by that? Just, I just want to do my own thing today. I can't be bothered going to church today. I don't feel like it. I'd rather stay at home asleep. I don't feel like participating in this prayer. I'm too tired. I don't really feel like taking up this church office because... Well, I don't feel like it. Do you know what I'm saying? And I wonder if, you know, is, are, are we going contrary against God's will here? You know, we, we have to work that one through ourselves. You know, we, we want to walk with God, don't we? We have to also understand that sin is just not those big things as well. It's also doing what I want when I feel like it. A little bit like Adam and Eve. Oh, that apple looks nice. I feel like doing it. And in, and in today's generation, when experiential is the ultimate goal, is amassing uh, a huge amount of experiences, doing what I feel like, is also going against God and what he wants for our life. We need to learn to walk with God. You know, let, let, let's look at, you know, some sinful attitudes. Not talking to the hubby or the wife, you know, putting on the old salt, you know. 
I want to punish her, so I won't talk to her for three days. So when you see her, you go, and you walk off in a huff. Arguments in church. People behaving badly inside and outside church. God says to love. But sometimes we choose to hate or bear grudges. Oh, do you remember what they did? Or do you remember what that group did when they came? God instructs us to forgive, but often we like to hold on to grudges. God wants us to be his instruments on earth. And through our lives and through our family, through our relationships, he wants to demonstrate the character of God and the character of his message through our lives, through our relationships and through our family. And we need to be mindful of some of the mind games that we can play with each other and in the church. We need to be very careful about some of the grudges that we hold on to because the ultimate, the ultimate penalty for sin is what? Death, separation from God. And the Bible is very, very clear on that. And it doesn't just look at the big things that we look at. It also looks at the smaller things, things like gossip. Now, we love gossip, don't we? Oh, we won't go there. But the Bible is quite clear that those who participate in things like that will be separated from God. But yet gossip does destroy people, people's lives. The plague. After three centuries of the plague, it finally reached a, a very small village in, in England called Eam. And George Vickers, who was a tailor in the town, received this little small package. And when he received this package, he he opened it up and, and there were some fleas that escaped. And in four days, George Vickers was dead. The plague in this village then spread to the people. What the people did then was they um, isolated themselves. They closed off this village. They didn't allow anyone to leave or come to the town because they knew that the plague had finally come to them. They unselfishly did this to, not, uh, to protect people from outside and to protect the further spread of this plague. And, and people sympathised with this village and they came and dropped them food at the ed edge of the village to try and help them. One year later, they came and they were expecting to find everyone in this village dead. But they actually found that some were still alive. Centuries later, they exhumed some of the bodies from this village and they found that they, they wondered why half the village survived. Half the village survived because they had a, a and they checked the DNA, they had a gene that protected them from the virus of the plague. And... Um, they could have swum in a pool of, of pure bubonic plague and they would never have got it. They were lucky. And so the randomness of the plague is, comes down to who your parents were. But you can't choose your parents, can you? You can't choose your parents. You can't choose when and where you're born. But we can choose how we respond to the gospel. We can choose how we respond to our Father in heaven. We can choose to have him as our Father in heaven. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Second Corinthians chapter 5.
says this here. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We are his ambassadors. How are ambassadors appointed in our world today? They are appointed by the prime minister of the country that they serve. What is the role of an ambassador? The ambassador is to represent the country that they serve, both in attitude and the words that they say and in the things that they do. They are to represent the policies of the country that they serve. My, my wife, when we were living in Canberra, had the unfortunate privilege of working for the Israeli embassy there. Well, on the one hand, she found it very interesting, but it was also quite distressing for her for a number of reasons that I'll, I, I won't go into too much detail. But the ambassador at that point in time went on a um, trip to China for a trade mission for, for Israel. Why he did as, um, from, from Canberra, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but... Um, in an interview that he did in Hong Kong on his way back to Canberra, he um, <clears throat> had this to say at an interview, because the trade mission that he led didn't go well at all. And he said this, and please don't take offence, I'm only reflecting what he said. He said this, that these yellow-skinned people are very are cowards when it comes to uh, trading with Israel. And um, he basically went along that line. Well, these comments got passed into the press, and they got wind of it. And as a result, there was all these protests outside the Israeli embassy, as you could understand. These comments were offensive. Why he said it like that, a mind only boggles. Now, <clears throat> once it got to press and all the protests were, the protests were actually so bad that they actually set up these large bollards outside the embassy of the Israeli embassy to try and have additional security. The Israeli embassy has the highest security, has the same as the US embassy in Canberra, has the highest security out of all of them, but they increased their security even more over and above that. Um, and um, so my wife, uh, so, so as a result, he got recalled back to Israel and he got six months to serve out his um, ambassadorship. In other words, he got recalled, he got fired, but he um, was to serve out six months until he got fired. So my wife came in about a few weeks after that and my wife has Asian looks and she got treated shockingly and uh, as, after three months she ended up leaving. And, um, and, and, Bas and, and when he left, the diplomatic protection squad rang Joyce up. And I won't quote it for word for word, because you'll find, um, anyway. He, he said, um, <clears throat> hi Joyce, it's um, so-and-so here from um, diplomatic protection squad. Guess what, I'm at the airport. And I am looking at the plane that the ambassador is on. And yes, yes, the plane is now taking off. Yes, yes. I just thought I'll share that good news with you. Okay, I'll hang up. And, and that was the impression that he had of the ambassador. And, um, and everybody celebrated when he left. Now... My wife, who has Asian looks, gets, got treated really badly there, and as I said, she left after three months. That ambassador was a horrible man who didn't represent his country right, and that's why he got fired. We are called by God to be ambassadors for him. And we might be have 
great 2020 vision when it comes to looking at spots on other people's robes. Some people may not wear the ring on the right finger or wear it in the same way or lace the sandals in the same way or think the same as we do. But we need to be very careful at pointing out spots in other people's robes because we also have spots on our robe and this is why we are covered with Christ's robe of righteousness. Christ covers our spots and our sins. That is why we are saved by grace. And we are called to be ambassadors. We are called to share the good news with other people. We are called to not only speak it, we are called to live it. We've got to speak nice things. And I'm not talking about just putting on the mask here and pretending. I'm talking about not only speaking but also demonstrating, but when we fall down, that we have some transparency about it. Hey, I am struggling in this area here. Help me. Hey, I'm not perfect. I say wrong things. I do wrong things. But I also endeavour to apologise for it as well. So we need that transparency. Rather than walking around pretending we are perfect, we are Christ's ambassadors, all of us, we have a high calling. We are called to speak it. We are also called to demonstrate it. And in our lives, we need to understand the pervasiveness and the seriousness of sin. And when we minimize it down to just merely doing the wrong things, we minimize sin. And that's cheap grace. We need to live under his grace as well as graciously. We need to recognise that our need is to be saved by his grace. That's our need. What we also need is to respond to that and to live by his grace each day recognising our foibles, asking God to help us and living for him each day and every day. And I just encourage you to take that journey. We have a high calling, but by his grace, we walk with him. He'll walk with us. He'll help us up. He'll give us the strength to overcome. And he'll also give us the right words to say at the right time. Sometimes things do need to be confronted. But they also need to be confronted graciously as well. And in a Christian way. And let us walk with the Lord as we are ambassadors for him. For I pray this in Jesus' name. All right. Our final hymn. Jesus keeps me near the cross. Let's um, bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord, for the kind of God that you are. You demonstrated your character when you went to the cross. And you told Pilate that he didn't have power except that it wasn't given, except that it was given from above. And yet, Lord, you had ultimate power and you went to the cross. You went to the cross because you loved each one of us. And we thank you for that love, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation and the wonderful gift of grace. May we treasure this gift, Lord. And Father, we thank you that through your stories in the Bible that you give us more glimpses of your character. And we thank you, Lord, that you run and greet us with open arms and you hug us and you embrace us when we come to the foot of the cross. Father, we ask that as in our journey and as we walk with you, Lord, 
and as we are ambassadors for you, that you will help us not to be like his brother. And that you will help us to represent you aright in how we walk. Help us to appreciate the pervasiveness and the depth of sin. And as we come to understand that, help us also to appreciate more the depth and the gift that you have given each of us. Father, may we treasure the, the gift of life, the gift of salvation more than life itself, much more than what this world offers. And Father, I, I just pray for us as a church here, that as a community here, that when people come through this door, that they will find here a demonstration of your love and of your gift here. And that they will find a home and warm fellowship because we always want to do things right. Sometimes we do slip up. But Father, help us to always uphold that high standard because we always want to be a light and a beacon to this community, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of service that we have here, Lord. And I thank you also for the wonderful work that all our volunteers do here. And may all what we do bring glory for you, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.